We're going to start late. Um, fortunately, we've got many, many other trainings that we can go over. And the meat of this is really Audubon staff. So, um, so there we go. We'll include other information about dogs and all of that good stuff mm -hmm. at another time. Um, so jumping back into dog rules from um, sunrise until 9 a.m., dogs are, are allowed on our beaches outside of the restricted area on leash and under voice control. Um, if they're off leash, they need to be under voice control. Um, from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m., no dogs are allowed on our beaches. And then from 5 p.m. until dusk, dogs are allowed, but they must be leashed. Um, so you can see why it's really helpful to have that information written down because it is pretty confusing. Um, so pair that with our restricted areas going into effect on April 1st. It's a lot to keep track of. Um, so we do have blue signs like the one you see on your screen right now um, posted um, from May 15th until Labor Day. Um, and then there are green signs um, that are posted from Labor Day to May 14th that um, talk about the winter dog rules. We have questions about dog rules. All right. You hear me? Yes. You might be aware already that the sign closest to the water at some point is gone. Yeah, I actually, um, thank you for that. I got in a text from a friend actually who was on Pine Point yesterday showing me the, the signpost that has been sheared off. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we did let Public Works know because it is a, not only is it important so people know where the um, the restricted area is, but it's a huge safety hazard right now because it is pretty, pretty jagged. Yeah. So if anybody's walking in that area, um, they could get a gnarly cut. So Public Works was supposed to be down there today to take care of that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I did this last year for the first time, but my one thing that stuck in my mind is that it, from 7 to 9 a.m., one of my shifts on Wednesdays, they, um, the dogs seem to be chasing balls a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that owners or dogs are better behaved under voice control early in the morning than the rebel rousers that come out after five. Yeah. Why? I mean, have people really noticed that they don't need to be leashed early so, in the morning? So, um, for those on Zoom who may not have heard, the question is um, why are dogs allowed off leash early in the morning? And um, are they really that much better behaved? I think it's more a matter of how busy our beaches are. And so because there's likely to be fewer people, it's it's not necessarily a, a plover issue at that point. It's a it's a people issue. Um, so there are um, probably fewer people on the beach between sunrise and 9 a.m. Um, and so fewer people dog conflicts at that time. Um, more likely to have people on the, the beaches in the afternoon, so dogs need to be leashed. Seems like the boat are just as um, active early in the morning. They sure are running up, running up and down the side zone. Yeah. But this is the this is not the restricted area. So the only air, all of the areas you showed us are restricted. Yes. The only area that would cover is really on either Pine Point to the side mm -hmm. or on Ferry Beach before the sign comes up. Right. So in, in those areas, you're really not seeing, you're not marking them off anyways as being full or active. Yeah. So the, the comment was that um Dogs are only allowed outside the restricted area. The restricted area is where plovers tend to be. Um, that's not where they always are. I mean, they're in. the plovers don't follow the signs. If only we could get plovers to read signs, <laughs> then so many of our, our these issues might be resolved. But the people need to read the signs. You can't expect little birds to do that. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're talking specifically about outside the restricted area. Um, but you know, it's it's an invisible line that marks that restricted area. Unless you're on Higgins Beach, they do have a whole line of signs that they put out and take in um, with the turning of the tide that that does mark the um, the restricted area. Um, so I mean, dogs can cross that line. Hopefully, they're not crossing to the point where they're seeing plovers during you know our summer season. Um, but I will say that we know that we've had dogs in the restricted area currently. Um, that went into effect on April 1st. So um, so while the dog rules do change May 15th, if you're able to get out there earlier um, and, and keep an eye on things and talk to people and educate them about um, 
the plovers and why we're doing what we're doing, um, it's super helpful. I do want to say something off of that. Mm -hmm. um, this season at the start, we've been having a lot more dog issues than in years past. Um, mm -hmm. Not sure if more people just adopted dogs during the COVID times or what it is. Um, we're also noticing that dog owners are perhaps not as susceptible to listening to us or being kind for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are trying to educate somebody and speak with them kindly, and they are being confrontational, please don't go on a tour with that person. In today's society, unfortunately, people are quick to snap. Um, so don't ever put yourself in danger or in with a confrontational person. If they're not going to listen to you, just reach higher up, reach out to Jamie, reach out to us, reach out to the police. Um, but we've had some, some pretty nasty um, interactions with dog owners already for the start of the season. So just be aware and and use your discretion when approaching. Do you see that more inclusive beaches or is it all the beaches? Um, it's all the beaches. Um, Old Orchard, I actually had a pretty nasty interaction with a woman yesterday whose dog bit at my hand and then she proceeded to kick sand and rack on top of all my gear and stuff. Um, so it's just, I mean, some people are really receptive when we say, hey, can you leech your dog? And other people are just downright nasty. So just be aware if you're talking to somebody and they you start seeing those signs of, of aggression or conflict, just let it let it die and pass it on to the next person. It's never worth it for you guys to, to put yourself in a, a dangerous situation. Yeah, and I'm, um, related to that, one of the best things you can do is just try to remember a description of the person and the dog. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, if if there are other reports, we'll know that it's it's become a pattern. If you see um, if you see them leaving the beach and you see what vehicle they're getting into, license plate numbers are great. Mm -hmm. I would not recommend taking out a camera and mm -hmm. taking photos of them. That will just escalate the, the situation. But on that note, I mean, I think all of us, I did this last year for a particular bottle. So we're out there alone, maybe partnering up, partnering up, maybe two people scheduled at the same time. You know, yeah. It's so much harder to confront someone mm -hmm. and it's just you. Yeah. And it may, it may have some of these other people think twice if there's two of us there. So um, the, the comment um, was that maybe we should do a buddy system and have two people scheduled at the same time. I can try to do that. Um, and you know, you're know you always welcome to bring a friend along, um, even if they're, they're not trained safety in numbers and things like that. Um, but like I said, our, you know, our numbers right now on Pine Point and Barry and Western Beach, um, we've essentially got two shifts per day covered um, assuming that everybody that signed up is going to follow through with volu volunteering. So um, having a, having double duty on, on each shift is going to be tough, but I'll see what I can do. Yeah. So the confrontation I had last year on Western Beach was a couple who had uh, two dogs, a Rottweiler and some other huge dog on the restricted area. And they were convinced that they could have dogs out there because the attendant had told them it was okay to bring their dogs through. Yeah, we had that same situation where the attendant told them actually it was uh, somebody with a kite. Yeah. And so they could leave their dogs. And they were off leash as well. So, I mean, it, you know, no, no amount of talking or convincing or persuasion that could convince them that they were not going to walk that beach. Yeah. In that situation, if you're on the Western side, you can. Tell people that Western Beach is private and it's owned by Crowd Snack Country oh, Club. I and Debbie will there. come I down and there. light them right up if she sees them. Um, yeah. You can let them know they can get prosecuted for being even on that beach with their dogs. Sometimes yeah. enough if you throw law words around. I, I try. At, at yeah. any persuasive argument, and, and they were. And some people just. They just said, nope, the guy at the front said, yeah. you could come here, and they kept with their dogs. So. So and the attendants been trained. They are going to be trained much better this summer. Yeah, I was. Oh, so I am done in my attendance. <laughs> Give him a break. He just started this. <laughs> I just I start. Thank you for calling me up here. So I'm going to training with our staff um, prior to opening weekend, and I'll put all this. I'm going to put together like a manual for them. Perfect. So yeah, and Maine Audubon would be happy to join you if he wants to be enforcement. Yeah, I'm just gonna. 
I put together a handbook for them. I'm gonna have this signage hanging. Um, so they can just refer to it. And if the people argue with them, they can say yes. and that way it doesn't put them in a awkward position. Mm -hmm. Right. So thank you for sharing those anecdotes. And I, I think we're always going to have negative interactions, unfortunately. Um hopefully we'll have more positive interactions than negative ones. Unfortunately, those negative ones really just stand out um, and are very memorable. Um, and we learn something new every year um, through this program and with our beach attendance and, and everything. So always trying to improve um, your feedback is, is really valuable. Um, and like I said, they'll be they'll have a better understanding of, of what is and isn't allowed. Um, I know I had a, a, a circumstance a couple years ago where I was at a meeting on Pine Point. It was after May 15th and people were walking in with their dogs and I stopped them and I was like, you know, um, the town has summer dog rules that are in effect. You can't bring your dog here at this time of day. And they're like, oh, well, we just called the town office and they said that we could. And I was like, oh no, I need to now go, you know, double check with our, our town clerk's office to make sure they know. No, it turns out they called the Old Orchard Beach didn't realize that they were actually standing in Scarborough um, mm -hmm. and that, you know, there is a town line and the, the rules are different from one side of that stretch of beach to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think in all of these situations, um, we try to assume positive intent. Sometimes that's difficult. Um, you know, even if you see someone walk by three signs to get to the area with their dog where they're not supposed to be, be like, oh, yeah, you're not supposed to have dogs here. You must have Miss the sign when you walked in or, or you know, well, just, <laughs> yeah. so, um, you know, friendly and approachable. If they react negatively, then, you know, walk away. Your safety um, is, is more important than um, the endangered species that are living on our beach. So, all right, do we, another question? Is there ever any uh, attempt to uh, sort of standardize the message between towns? So that all um, is related to local ordinance. So, um, no. <laughs> yeah, I think that would, that would be awesome, um, but it's all, um, all based on the, so the question was, is there um, any thought or discussion of standardizing the rules between towns? Um, and that's all a decision made by local town councils. Um, and so, you know, who they're hearing from and what their priorities are for their town kind of dictate what their their rules are. Um, so standard standardization of dog rules hasn't been something that has happened um, regularly. Um, I, I will say more and more towns are putting rules in, in place um, uh, in terms of dogs on beaches. And um, it looks like that's causing a lot more of out of town dogs coming to Scarborough beaches. Um, which is then makes it really hard um, for you volunteers and for um, us municipal staff because we're pretty good about getting the word out to our residents. Our residents get our e-newsletter. They will read um, the leader local paper. They will follow um, the town on social media. So it's easy to get the information out to our local residents, but it's not so easy to get the, the information out to people from out of town. Um, so that's that's a challenge. All right, I think we can move on. All right, so again, restricted areas. And now I'm gonna turn it over um, to Rachel from um, Maine Audubon, and she will go through um, kind of the, what to look, what you're going to be looking for and seeing on the beaches for um, signs of plovers and all of that good stuff. Thank you, Jamie, appreciate it. Um, I apologize, first off, for my appearance. My colleague Silas and I just came out of the rain and wind today out in the field, so I look a little bit dumpy, but here I am. Um, so Are you warm? Are you warm? I am not warm yet, no. I, I will be later, I think. Um, so piping clovers and these turns in Maine. Um, so first of all, I'm Rachel Parent. I am one of the wildlife biologists this year with Maine Audubon. Um, my colleague Silas Whedon, one of our other biologists, both of us are returning this year, which is great. Um, so our project, Jamie gave you a little bit of a rundown. I see a lot of familiar faces, so that should make conveying this information to you guys a little bit easier for me. Um, slide, please. Yeah. 
So the star of the show, the piping plover, um, our sandy colored shorebirds. <laughs> Here this year, I brought with us, I don't know its real name, but I fondly call this Mountie. Um, so this is what a piping clover looks like. This is the size, this is the coloration, this is full breeding plumage. This is what you're looking for on the beach. Um, Rachel, right, yeah. I just swapped over to the blurry camera. Okay. Um, can you maybe hold that up to the... Yes. Um, it follows me, right? It does, yeah. Okay. okay. If yeah. everybody can see, there's Mountie. Hold on, put it down a little lower. Here we go. Up Is that good? Up. up a little higher? <laughs> there we go. We'll just do this one more. A couple more times. Perfect. All right. Um, so that is, I know last year some people had not seen a piping clover before. Um, so I thought this was a great way to do that visual. Um, really small birds. Really hardy birds, though, so they nest from the California or from the Californias, <laughs> from the Carolinas all the way up to Canada. Um, we see a lot of nesting here in Maine. Massachusetts has a really big program, um, and then also these birds have populations um, in the Mississippi River Basin and um, and the Great Lakes. Um, so all the same species, um, but just different areas that they like to nest. Working on it. That's right. <laughs> um, and then our side character, I guess, if you will, the least turn. Um, Higgins Beach has a population of least turns colony that nests there. Um, we're hoping to have them back again this year. Um, Goose Rocks and then Seawall Beach is also, but you guys won't be worried about that too much. Um, so these little guys are going to nest in a colony. They're usually down by the Spurwink River in a large group. Hard to miss them if you get close. Um, if any of you are familiar with them, they use many defense mechanisms, including dive bombing and pooping on you if you get too close. Um, so while they are fun to enjoy from far away, I don't recommend getting too close to their colony or they will come come yeah. after you. <laughs> Slide, please. Um, all right, so um, least ferns, um, they feed off of forage fish. Their chicks need to be fed by the adults, unlike clover chicks. Um, they are here for a shorter season. They are a lot more skittish than the plovers. Um, so if a dog ran through their colony, that's enough to scare them off and they'll leave their nests, they'll leave everything and they'll take off and they may never come back to that location again. Um, so we really want to be careful of making sure that their little corner over on the spur wing is nice and protected. They do pretty well at keeping people out. Um, so <laughs> as long as they stay tucked in that corner this year, we should be pretty good to go. There was one on Western Beach towards the end of the year, like a mother and a father. Yeah, dive bombing. <laughs> yeah, and you're lucky you didn't get pooped on. <laughs> I, I just want to note too that um you'll you may see like white netting on um on Tegan's beach um and that is management for lease turns um it's electric fence to help keep predators yeah out of their colony yeah I would not recommend touching it also if you're out there and you see that the electric fencing is kind of hanging down if it touches the ground or gets wet it shorts we can fix it we can fix the circuit um but if you see that it's falling down, just give us a call and we'll come out there and fix it back up so it can do what it needs to do. Last year, it went down for a few days during some of the high tides and we had a fox that got in there and had a heyday. So um, it is important that we always have that up and running, um, but don't touch it. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so both of these birds are specialists at nesting and living in beach habitats. Um, these are the least turn eggs. They are speckly and similar to the plover eggs, but they have a little bit more of a swirl on them. Um, they don't use a traditional scrape like a plover. They're a little bit more lazy, so they'll give a little one, two, three, and then drop the eggs right in the open sand. Um, the nest on the bottom is a plover nest. You can see the eggs are pretty similar, um, speckly, but the speckles are a little more pronounced and less swirly. They use a little more camouflage tactic when they nest sometimes, as you can see um, some of the dune grass for protection. They will do a deeper scrape in the sand and put in a little more effort um, for their, their decided nest. 
Um, so not only do they rely on camouflage when they are laying eggs, um, they rely on camouflage for everything. That is a plover's best defense mechanism. So when chicks are born, this chick was only a few hours old, unfortunately, um, and passed away in my boss's hand during the fireworks show on Old Orchard. Its parents got scared of the fireworks. It wasn't able to live. Um, this is what they look like when they're born. They can't fly. They can't do a whole lot. They need to feed themselves immediately. So you can imagine that camouflage is their best tactic. When this little thing is out on the sand and it's not moving, it's really difficult to see. Um, middle age, same thing. They're sandy colored. They're gonna blend in really well. They still can't fly. So stop and freeze is their best mechanism. Um, it also makes them vulnerable to getting stepped on. So it's kind of a blessing and a curse. Um, and then back to the eggs, they're sandy colored, speckled so that they blend in really well with the sand, um, which makes it more difficult for predators to spot, but it also makes it more difficult for beach goers to spot. Oops, these. Um, okay, so we talked about the, um, the restricted areas that we have on a beach. We choose these areas because of historical nesting locations, um, but we also choose some of these areas because they simply have really great habitat, and we hope that the birds will choose those areas. They never listen to us, but um, so these birds are going to be feeding all the way from where the dune grass starts to thin out and come into the sand all the way down into the intertidal zone um, in low tide. Generally speaking, their nests are going to be up higher. It's difficult to nest below the tide line. You're going to wash your nest. Um, often they're in kind of this patchy grass, dune grass area. That is their ideal place um, to lay eggs. So here we have um, our very cute chicks, arguably, I think, the cuter chick, um, the least turn. So they are endangered in Maine, but they are not listed federally. Um, and then the piping plovers are endangered in Maine and they are threatened federally. Um, I believe there's a slide that explains endangered versus threatened later. If not, I will touch on, on the difference. Um, so being wildlife on the beach, um, if any of you go out on the beach this time of year, you know it's maybe not as pleasant as when you go out on the beach in late June or July. Um, it's really difficult to make a living on the beach. So there are temperature extremes, there are crazy weather, tidal events. Those things are only um, becoming more frequent. Um, and then there's also all kinds of predators. And then you have to worry about human impact as well. Um, so it's a tough place to live. And these little birds have chosen for their home, making them pretty tough little birds. Um, so Maine's beaches, you guys are familiar. This picture is a Gunquit beach um, in April when we start. We go out there and we see maybe five or six people the whole time we're out there. Come July, this is also a Gunquit beach. Um, thousands of people start showing up. And you guys know that um, Scarborough beaches tend to be a little bit quieter, but still lots and lots of people. Please. Um, so arrival, um, these little guys show up the end of March um, through May, they keep coming through um, and essentially what they do, they don't like their neighbors, so they will show up and they start taking, staking out territory. Um, when they're doing this, the males tend to be the more territorial, um, so the females will kind of stand back and you'll see all these plovers, they get down really low and they all chase each other. And it's a really ridiculous scene. Um, but what it is, is the males staking out a territory and showing the females how tough they are and what a good mate they will make. Um, so, oops, sorry. Um, find, okay, so, yep, so they find the mate. Um, they do, I think somebody had mentioned that they got to see the mating dance the other day. It's a little bit brutal, um, but if you ever see it, so the male, he'll stand up real straight, starts peeping, peeping, and then he walks up to the female and he starts kicking her like this. And he kicks sand right at her butt. Um, and then he will jump on her back, does a little deed, it's true love. And then he'll pull some feathers out of the back of her neck and then jump off and voila, clover eggs. Um, so a little bit brutal, but it's true love. 
Um, so after they have done that four times, they will have a four egg clutch. Um, max clutch is always going to be four eggs. They wait until all four eggs have um, have been placed in the scrape before they will start the incubation process. Reason for that being, um, they want all of their chicks to hatch right around the same time on the same day so that they're not sitting and incubating while they have younglings running all over the beach. Um, so males and females take turns. Um, they split incubation times while one will feed and the other sits. Um, and then 28 days after the fourth egg, they start to hatch. Okay, so defensive nests and chicks. Um, so this we call a broken wing display. Um, essentially what's happening, I don't think there are eggs in this picture, but he has a little scrape in front of him. So if they have a test nest or scrape, um, eggs or chicks, you will see this behavior. And essentially what the bird is doing is feigning injury. Um, he sees you as a predator. So what he's doing is going, I'm hurt follow me, I'm an easy target, come this way. He's trying to pull you away from the egg so you don't see that, um, or so other predators don't see that. So what he's doing, he's not really injured. We do get calls and people are like, oh no, this plover has a broken wing. Um, what we tell people is no, it probably isn't injured. You're probably just too close to its territory or it's young. Um, so you'll see it, it'll start peeping, it'll drag. Some of them get really dramatic. Sometimes both the males and females will do it and they'll split ways. Um, but if you ever see this behavior, stop what you're doing, look around at your feet, make sure you're not gonna step on a nest and then back up a little bit and give them some extra space to do their thing. Thank you. Um, okay, so chicks hatch. Um, as I showed you guys, chicks are tiny, tiny. Um, they need to double in size in the first 24 hours that they're alive. Unlike traditional birds, their parents don't feed them at all. Never a meal, never once. Um, so at that size, they sit in the nest cup for a minute and kind of dry out in the sun a bit, and then they're up on their wobbly little legs and they go straight down to the tide line. Um, they're obviously very, very, very vulnerable at this time. There's a lot of space between where their nest is and where they're going. There's a lot of variable conditions in between there. Um, people, pets, even holes on the beach, chicks can fall inside of a hole and they're unable to get back out. Um, so we ask if you guys see big holes while you're out there, just kick some sand in it, just especially when we have, have the youngsters out there. Um, but yes, they head down, they're really vulnerable at this time. They're so cute, but it's so important um, to give them lots of space so that they can make it through their first 24 hours. How do you pronounce that, that word? Um, pre coacal So, yes. A, does that mean a, a coacal is the hole for everything on a bird. Um, so it's what everything comes out of. It is also the love making hole. Everything. So it's called a coacal kiss when birds mate. Mm -hmm. Um, so they are not. They're not ready for that yet. Immature, essentially, oh, is what that means. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep, fun terms that birders <laughs> use. Um, okay, so again, yeah, chicks are always moving. Um, if you've ever seen the chicks on the beach, you'll know they just, they're running constantly. Their defense mechanism though is to freeze because they can't fly. So back to the camouflage, if they're not moving, predators are less likely to see them. Um, so if you get too close, they will stop. Obviously, it can make them more vulnerable just because um, human and pet interactions. Um, but on a whole, that keeps them safe from everything else out there that wants to eat them. Um, so broods move everywhere. Um, we put the exclosures out and they have their nests. That sometimes doesn't mean anything to them. Um, once they're born, they can move miles down the beach. Sometimes they'll team up with another brood. Sometimes adults will be deadbeat parents and they will push their chicks off onto other adults. Um, and you'll see an adult that has eight chicks and you're like, hmm, where did you all come from? Um, so just because they have an exclosure or a marked nesting area, once they hatch, they have um, no allegiance to that territory anymore. And then we have our fledgers. So this one is getting close not quite, it'd be a little bit bigger than this. 
um, just a tiny bit smaller than our adults. And this is um, what we have fondly termed at Maine Audubon as their scrumbly phase. So basically they're gonna have scruffy feathers all over the place. They're a little bit awkward. It's their weird teenage years. Um, they're learning to fly at this point. So after 25 days, generally most of them can take their first flight. Um, but during this stage, you'll see them kind of team up. They're doing practice flights, um, running up and down the beach. They're less vulnerable, but still um, unable to fly completely. Um, and then around 25 days, you start to see a lot of the fledglings will team up and have their little flight schools. And then they will kind of take off together as a group to do their first migration down south for the winter. When does it start the migration? <laughs> um, so females leave first. They're like, all right, we're out of here. We did the hard work. Um, they will leave anywhere from two weeks to a month after they have chicks. The males will stick around um, usually until chicks fledge. And then you'll start to see the males disperse um, and it takes the fledglings the longest, but usually 25, 30 days after they hatch, they're ready to start start leaving and heading back. Um, they go down to from the Carolinas um, to the Bahamas. So they leave us in the snow and they go find lovely beach weather elsewhere. And we'll see like Canadian plovers migrating through before yeah. our plovers have, mm -hmm. have started migrating. Mm -hmm. And we don't band our birds um, here because their um, their legs are so vulnerable to damage when we band them. Um, but there are some birds right now, actually on Western L80. Um, he has a nest, two eggs. Um, he's a banded bird. I need to get in touch with South Carolina's Fish and Wildlife and see if we have a backstory. If so, I'll pass it to Jamie and she can pass it to you guys. Um, that bird made it through the last one. Yes, yeah, I saw him today. Very defensive, um, good looking eggs. Yeah, happy to be there. Um, so sometimes we can see, you know, some different points of where birds have traveled. Um, the Midwest populations, they band the birds, they have hardier legs for some reason, I'm not really sure. Um, so they do a great job of, of seeing where birds move. But if we have a banded bird that shows up on the beach, we can look at the band number and go, oh, you know what, this bird was just nesting up in Canada. Um, so it's pretty cool to see all the movement that, that they make for such little tiny birds. Um, okay, so efforts. Um, last year was our most successful year and as the numbers are on there, right? 145. But I want to make sure, otherwise my boss is going to hear this and be like, don't know the numbers. Oh, and I just missed. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, I believe I last year, wasn't it? Yeah, 242 um, for fledglings. And then um, 143 nesting pairs, I believe, were the numbers for Maine. Um, that was the most successful year that we've seen since Maine Audubon implemented this program, which is great. Um, absolutely impossible to have those numbers were it not for volunteers, um, homeowners that are willing to work with us and all of that. So it's been a collaborative effort, definitely. So their migration back down south is not dependent upon weather or uh, season? No. I mean, if they hatch here in May, I mean, 25 days later is still just June. Right, and some of them will Leave start them. to take off. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, they're really, their only business here up north is to to bring on the next generation. They don't want to be here much longer than June. Um, <laughs> kind of like the rest, you know, they're all, by August, they're basically, um, they basically all head itself. Um, we will have some stragglers here and there or migrants coming from further north and stopping over on our beaches. Um, but for the most part, they mm -hmm. they do what they need to do and they're they're out of here for warmer climates. So why are we on that slide now? Sorry, guys. <laughs> I have a quick question. Yeah. How far did they fly like in increments to go down? Miles. Like a hundred miles? I'm just curious. You know, that's actually a great question that I'm not 100% sure okay. of how many they would do. Um, I would, um, which is pretty crazy because on the beach, these birds 
flying is their very, very, very last resort. Yeah. They want to run everywhere. So people are like, can they even fly? But yes, they're pretty incredible at flights. They just don't like to do it very much. I think an interesting uh, question, Jim, or a comment, is the difference between the adult birds that have successfully migrated and who now can navigate. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. have more skills um, and but the chicks can only orienteer, so they're hardwired to go in a direction. Yeah. So their vulnerability is not over once they correct their vulnerability, particularly just in the Atlantic flyway, is that right. it can get blown out to sea and they're just going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So um whether they can, you know, I'm pretty sure they can sense they'll stay low in bad weather. Definitely. Yeah, they'll they'll have stopover points. Um, the fledglings try to team up together, and I think that might help if the path is going this way and they're like, hey, we're over here. Um, but yeah, they're still really vulnerable during during that first migration. Um, a bit of a tangent. So Maine Audubon, we have a program called Bird Safe where we monitor um, bird strikes on buildings in downtown Portland during migration season. Um, and we see that in the fall, the bird strikes are a lot higher because a lot of these birds are doing their first migration. So in the spring, these birds are seasoned. They know that's a building I'm about to run into. Um, in the fall, you have a lot more young migrators. Um, so we see higher numbers of, of casualties, strike casualties in the fall. <clears throat> um, okay, so more on why we're so successful. Um, we're doing great, but only because of all the effort that you guys are putting in, um, that my colleagues are putting in, the towns are putting in. If we pulled everything and went off the beach right now, I don't think these birds would have a really great shot. Um, they're trying really hard to keep up, but human interference just moves a lot faster than they can adapt to our changes. Um, so keeping your eyes open, keeping your ears open, educating people and letting them know um, and getting people to really love and care about the birds. If people don't care, it's so hard to get them to follow the rules. So if you can show them a chick and then they're like, oh, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. You know, you could change somebody's mind. Um, or if they see the mating behavior or hear them peeping, you know, something like that um, could really change somebody's mind and, and soften their heart a little bit for these lovable characters who couldn't like these birds. Um, okay, so. What's a piping plover and when is it not a piping plover? Um, we have some fun friends here. So we have a sanderling, sandpiper, um, semi-palmated plover, and a killdeer. Obviously, all of these birds could look pretty similar. Sanderlings, um, they will hang out in groups with plovers. A um, little bit longer bill, but very similar color. So if you're off in the distance, um, you could either mistake sanderlings for plovers or miss the plovers because they're hanging out in these big groups. Um, we get a lot of calls about um, the semi-palmated plover. Obviously, beak marking is the same. They have um, the neck band, the unibrow. Um, they're just a bit darker. They're dark brown and they're not protected. Um, so we care about them, but we just don't care about them quite as much. Um, and then the killdeer. Um, killdeers are infamous for nesting wherever, whenever. Um, they've been found in parking lots, anywhere. So we get calls, oh no, there's a piping plover nesting in the parking lot of the ice cream place. And we're like, okay, it's probably a killdeer. We go check and of course it's a feisty little killdeer. Um, nothing wrong with having people that you know, are calling, we'd rather have people call and say this, there's a bird here, it could be a plover and have it not be a plover, than have somebody not call um, and then have us miss a nest. But these are um, some similar looking friends of the plover, but not, not a piping plover. Um, okay, I think I just said this mostly, sneaky piping lookalikes. Um, so yeah, semi-palmated, um, muddy versus sand, sleeker, they're definitely very suave compared to the plovers. Um, they're a little bit thinner, so you kind of see them walking around like, um, they're not better. They're not better. They just think they're <laughs> they better. Think they're <laughs> um, but they're typically in a, a bigger flock. Plovers, usually you'll see um, two, two to a few of them, um, where these guys will travel in flocks of 20 or more. 
Um, and then here's some more babies. So spotted sandpiper chicks, you could see they're all fluffy and legs. Um, they could be mistaken for plover chicks. Same thing with the killdeer. Um, we've definitely had calls about um, plover chicks and it's it ends up being one of these two, which again, very cute. We love them all. Um, but unfortunately our funding does not reach far enough that these, these species need protection. Um, so education, dog rules, we talked a lot about that. Um, I think dogs this year from the trends we're seeing already um, are going to be maybe a little bit of an issue, but all we can do is the best that we can do and tell people and educate them. Um, like I said, never put yourself in, in a dangerous situation over dog rules. Um, kites and drones. So kites and drones um, kind of look like a bird of prey as far as plovers are concerned. So when it's flying up there, um, they see a predator. Um, not an issue if people want to fly kites and drones as long as they are doing it far away from restricted areas. Um, the issue with this is plovers will get defensive and they will take off from their nests, um, take off from their chicks and band together to chase this predator. Mm -hmm. So we saw it at Higgins last year, somebody had their drone out, um, kind of in that intertidal area out of the restricted zone, but in front of it. Um, and every single adult plover on the beach was chasing this. Um, and we showed up and we could hear them all yelling and we're like, something's wrong. And then we saw them out there and it's not quite a murmuration where you see birds fly in a, a pack like that, but, but very similar behavior. Um, if they're harassed for too long or they feel threatened for too long, um, they will lose their nests. Same as they did for the uh, fireworks in Old Orchard Beach. So there comes a point when they're like, nope, this isn't worth it anymore. We'll go try somewhere else. Um, so we just like to eliminate that at the source. <laughs> and the kite boarding sailors. Yeah, so kite boarding um, and what's the other one? Windsurfing. Windsurfing, yep. Um, Luckily, so the Windsurfer Union or Windsurfer Association that stages on Western, mm -hmm. they're very receptive and in contact with me constantly about where the birds are. They're, yeah, they're really awesome. They try to stage over on the ferry side, um, or if they're doing Western, they try to do it away from bird activity. Mm -hmm. I do let them know when there are birds and they'll move or they'll go over to somewhere on Pine Point. Um, so that can be an issue just when they're staging, but once they're out in the water, it doesn't tend to bother the birds. Can we um, say that they stage? I, I did have that experience that year. Okay. It's okay as long as it's not negatively affecting any birds. So if birds are visibly disturbed and upset, then just maybe explain to them, can you go a little further? And it really is only a few seconds of them kind of catching the wind and getting out into right. the surf. Um, not our biggest problem, um, but definitely something to be be aware of. If you see birds in the area and they're staging, maybe just mention, yeah, mention, okay. you know, move it down, move it down a little bit. And like I said, um, all, all the people that um, windsurf in Scarborough have been really awesome um, and receptive to what we're doing, which is great. And last year on Western was a little bit of an anomaly because we had nests closer to fairy rocks than we typically do. Mm -hmm. Usually everything's mm -hmm. closer to Prout's Neck. Yeah. And so there isn't that, you know, as much conflict with, you know, staging, kite surfing at the point there. Um, Those birds are not nesting on the point right now. I'd really like them to not nest on the point. They had a really tough time last year. Um, some of the local teens figured out there was a dune path and they could hide and have their teen parties with their fire um, really, really close to our exclosure. There were a few times I came around the corner and there's like 50 to 100 kiddos out there for like a day camp thing. And I'm like, oh no. But um, I think they just got really disturbed. Um, and then all of their chicks got gulped down by seagulls. So I hope they find somewhere a little bit safer to go this year. Um, we'll see. <laughs> Fingers <laughs> crossed. Seagulls are predators then as well. Seagulls are certainly predators, yes. Um, seagulls are super opportunistic. They will gulp down a chick whole. They would try to put down an entire adult clover if they thought they could do it without choking. Absolutely. No shame in their game. They will They will go eggs, chicks, adults, yeah. Um, 
We talked about filling in the holes so chicks don't fall in. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then taking trash off the beach. It's gross to leave your trash on the beach anyway, regardless of birds. Um, but the big problem is it brings predators to the beach. So you leave your chip bag there, gull shows up, it's empty, he's hungry, he turns around and he goes, all right, that works, that looks good. Um, and eats a, a plover chick instead. So um, just having that stuff, it, it attracts foxes, raccoons, crows, um, gulls, any of that stuff. And, and we don't need extra of that out there. Yes. If, if there was a hole on the beach and you, the chick was in the hole, what do you think? I was thinking about that earlier. Um, You'd have to call Audubon or the woods. Yeah, service. I would call us. And then we'd go on a, a per a certain situation. Rescue. If I walked up and found a chick in a hole, I would reach down in the hole and pull the chick out. Um, we just maybe want to, and that might be what we would direct you to do. Um, but we would just prefer maybe that you call us first and we can give you some more direction. Or we might have somebody in the area. Um, <laughs> certainly, if it's a hole and tide is coming up and tide is going to fill that hole, and it's, yep. Yeah, just I, they're so 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 fragile. So last resort. Well, if you touch it, will the mother or father go to it again? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have had instances where kids have put it in their beach pail um, pockets. Um, people don't realize they think it's injured because it's not moving, and they bring it up to the lifeguard stand. We keep such good tabs on where broods are and how many chicks go in each area mm -hmm. that we're able a lot of the time to go. Okay. This brood over here is supposed to have four chicks and it only has three. And then you can release the chick nearby um, and it will, will go back with its family. So there's no scent-based anything like that where, where a mother's gonna reject it. Um, but last resort, very, very last resort, call us first um, before ever trying to touch a clover and take it into your own hands. Because if something does happen, um, then it's a whole, a whole mess of paperwork that nobody <laughs> wants to do. Question in the back. Getting back to um, literal debate and food and we will work out here. I did a travel thing in my own time, so I started to go around the parking lot and do trash cans are always over the village. I was there on Sunday morning in the second of the second shop there. I don't know the struggle called public works. That that would be awesome. <laughs> a combination of the people go there. I mean it's kind of educating people. So we do empty those twice a day. Um when they are filled, our attendants are directed to call us so we can empty them. Um a lot of it gets filled with household trash. Um so and they're partying and they're we 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 have things twice a day scheduled and then our tenants are advised to call us. Um, if you're you also going to have Spiegel pull in so if you call this and that one, I don't know yeah. if they call me and then I call the grass that makes sense. Community service. Yeah, but if you call the spec, they'll call my phone and I can call the trash guy and then they'll go down and do an extra run of the acid. So community services that thing it was the uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a program. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the question was about trash on the beach, um, and that, well, on the parking in the parking lots at the beach, um, and how to deal with that um, because it's often overflowing. So um, if you see, so the town's um, protocol is to empty the trash twice per day in the summertime. Um, if the trash is overflowing, you can reach out to um, Scarborough Dispatch. So that number is on the back of ID tags um, and they can get in touch with the appropriate person at community services so that that can get taken care of. And I hate to say this, but at least on Pine Point, our birds nest pretty far away from the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So if the gulls are occupied in the parking lot. <laughs> 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 Not that I ever want to be an advocate for for litter, but um, in that particular situation, yeah, there's always yeah. a silver lining. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so spotting for vehicles. Um, 
I don't think this is anything that any of you will have to worry about because you're never driving on the beaches. Um, some of our beaches, this is the same training we do for lifeguards, public works. Um, so this is important for them. But basically, it's just not driving on the beach without having somebody walking in front of your vehicle. Um, so lifeguards um, ripping around on their ATVs, they're not supposed to be doing that. They're supposed to have somebody slowly walking in front to make sure, um, especially chicks, um, because they freeze and they're really difficult to see if you're going Mach 10 on your ATV down the beach. Um, but like I said, this isn't something that you guys should have to worry about. Generally in Scarborough, we don't have people driving on the beaches besides public works. And, um, and they receive separate training? Yes. Yep. Um, so that, yeah, people, I think there are different um, bike rules for different municipalities, and that's not something that I'm actually certain about for Scarborough. Yeah, so our ordinance says that they need to be 250 feet away from any management. So, um, so that includes the stake and twine that's out there kind of marking areas where plumbers are likely to be and the nest exposures, the cave, like the fencing that's put around individual nests. Um, you need to be at least 250 feet away from both of those things. So essentially not in the restricted area. Yeah, and yeah, during high tide, there's no way that you could have 250 feet of space between you and the management. So I just feel like there's a lot of roads. Go ride your bike on the road or on the trail. What do you need to be on the beach for anyway? It's just my opinion, but um, all right. I think we're good. You guys, yeah. Um, okay, so Jamie and I were joking a little bit that it's funny we have these pictures of the Canadian signs, but not the signs that we use here in Maine. Um, if it wasn't this. raining, I would have grabbed one out of the truck, but I didn't feel like going back in the rain. Um, but essentially, these are the signs that we have up at the entrance to all of our beaches. Um, as you guys can see here, this one has an ATV. Ours actually do have a bicycle. Um, and then we have the dog sign. Most of them have a red circle with no dogs. And then obviously, um, litter. These are just informational signs. They give people um, a little rundown on the birds and a little guidance for being on the beach when the birds are around. Um, and then we have ours are diamond shape um, attention signs that we put along the fencing. Um, we usually try to pull it back a bit so if people want to come up and read the sign, they're not right against the stake and twine. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have another um, sign that has red writing um, and an illustration of Elise Hearn and a piping program. You guys may have seen those out on the beach. Um, and they just say restricted area, shorebirds, nesting and feeding. Um, so we put this out hoping that people will read these signs. Um, a lot of the time people ignore them, but they're there for information. Um, and you can always direct people if you know they want more information to the entrance sign um, and they can read a little bit more about the, the project and the birds. Um, so law enforcement issues. Um, so a take of an endangered species is illegal. And maybe I should go back. So um, endangered species mean that a species is on the brink of extinction without some sort of interaction from humans, um, likely because humans already interacted too much. Um, so if something isn't done and something isn't implemented, um, that species is likely to go extinct. Um, threatened is a step before that. So threatened species are likely to become endangered if nothing is done. Um, so just a little, a little back on those terms. Um, so then the term take, um, this is out of the Endangered Species Act, which is a federal um, act. So the term take means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture or collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. Um, so dogs chasing birds, dogs killing birds, house, not house cats, cat, outdoor cats killing birds, um, your child chasing a bird, your husband chasing a bird, your dad chasing a bird, um, picking up birds, moving our management, vandalizing things, any of these are considered a take um, under the Endangered Species Act. 
often it's going to be difficult to prosecute a take unless um, a bird actually is killed. Then we can move things a little further. You see somebody running after a bird down the beach. It's highly unlikely that law enforcement will come out um, and enforce this. Um, but they may, and they may give a warning. Sometimes a warning is enough to deter people from doing it another time. Um, sometimes people don't realize that the birds are protected, um, but realistically, every bird you see on the beach is protected under the Migratory Bird Act. So essentially adults shouldn't be out there chasing birds anyway, but you may see it. Um, so this can be kind of a shade of, of gray here um, for what this term take actually will be prosecuted for. Um, but certainly if you see somebody engaging in any of these activities that you think could lead to this, um, that's a great time to call the clover phone, um, email Jamie or call her, or if you can't get through, you can call law enforcement and say, hey, listen, I'm out here um, taking care of the clovers and there's a dog loose in management or, um, there's an adult man chasing clovers and I asked him to stop and he won't, you know, um, I believe law enforcement, if you call, they have to respond is that. I think it's often a judgment call. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. So depending on who you get on the phone and how much they like birds, you may get a great response. And I think it, it's what else is happening at yeah. that point in time right. also. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Um, Scarborough is a, a lovely place so hopefully there's not too much crime happening if you call somebody will be able to respond but you never know um we're a great resource if you see this happening too we always have the clover hotline if somebody has that phone um so you can give us a call too and we can we can take it from there um so here are some examples of times that law enforcement has gotten involved um, so domestic animals killing piping clovers. Um, so on Pine Point, there was a take with a dog a few years back. Um, they've killed chicks. Um, this has happened up in Phippsburg too. Um, cats have killed clovers, Kenny Bunkport, Biddeford. On the town line of Old Orchard in Scarborough last year um, between Pine Point, we had a cat pick up a female bird um, who was in in the process of nesting. So she had, I think, two or three eggs when the cat um, picked her up. We actually were able to find the owners. Um, it was a whole a whole debacle. Um, the female bird did live, which is really unlikely after being bit by a cat. Generally, infection sets in pretty quick. Um, she did not finish nesting. That was the end of her nesting season after that. Um, when losing chicks, obviously, it's really sad, especially if it's not natural. Um, for us, though, losing adults is far more detrimental to the population. Um, a breeding adult can have anywhere from four chicks a season to four chicks for four or five seasons, six seasons, eight seasons. Um, so losing an adult bird means you're losing out on the potential for all of those chicks to be born and then in turn become adults. Um, so obviously we, we do get bummed um, when we lose chicks, but uh, losing adults is a, a real tough blow for this, for this program and for the birds. Um, let's see. I talked a little bit about chicks getting moved off the beaches. Um, you know, kiddos are out there playing and they're like, oh, this is cute. They put it in their beach pail, bring it up to their parents, bring it to the lifeguards. We're never going to, we're not going to prosecute a child or something like that. Technically, yes, that is a take. Their parents are responsible for that. Um, it's not a malicious act, though. Um, chicks have been taken to the police station. Um, people see them breathe, they think they're hurt, and, and it causes problems. Um, they're probably not injured, and they probably don't need anybody's help. Um, but like I said before, we have successfully been able to reunite chicks with their broods. Um, so it's not always a sad story when this happens, but obviously we don't ever ever want this situation to happen on beaches. Um, so vandalism of our protective fencing um, and also our predator management exclosures um, doesn't happen often. I don't think we had any issues last year. It has happened before where people have ripped up the, the exclosures. Um, 
people have you know pulled staking twine out. Um, if you see something and it looks like somebody was being a little nefarious with our uh, management, just let us know and, and we can take it from there. Um, hopefully we don't see that happen this year, but just like yesterday when somebody got upset with me and decided to, to kick stuff all over the, the year I was working with, people are unpredictable. So, you know, you, you never know if somebody gets upset because the dog law is enforced and then they go back to retaliate. Um, so hopefully we don't have to deal with that at all this year, but but something to be aware of, nonetheless. Yeah, question is, um, what do you want our role to be, you know, like after the storm we just had, and there's downstream or down, fence, fence has been disrupted, signs may be now washed out. What, what do you want us to do? Um, if you are finding signs that are washed out kind of in the shore, maybe just collect those and put them closer to the management. Um, we're pretty aware after the storms come through what's happening. And we know that today on Western, it was so much damage control. Um, so we try to split the group and get out there. Um, Lennis is awesome. She'll go out and she'll fix things up. She's got her, her hammer and her trusty twine. She'll get out there and fix it. Um, but just let us know is probably the best course of action, just so that nobody's up in those areas where we may have um, a nest that people don't know about. Uh, just let us know and, and we'll get out there and fix it. So, and just to add on to that, nests aren't typically exclosed, so they don't usually put the cages around them until there are at least a couple eggs in there. So there could be nests that we're not aware of yet um, because they haven't been marked or exposed. So, um, you know, if you want to be helpful and put a piece of twine back up or whatever, just make sure you're staying outside the stakes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you mentioned, uh, Rachel mentioned that Glennis will go out and do, um, do things and maintain the management. Glennis, again, is our kind of volunteer coordinator on Higgins. She's been specifically trained and has specific permission to do that. Mm -hmm. And then um, you guys may see her out there, meet her. Um, Jess Benson is an employee of Crown Snack Country Club. Um, so she is essentially the Glennis of Western, but she doesn't do anything with any other volunteers. So she just goes out for us every day when we can't get out there. Um, so if you see somebody about my age with dark hair walking around in the dune, yep, she is allowed she to be walk. in there. Yeah. Um, so don't yell at her. <laughs> um, yes, she's awesome. She's out there all the time. Um, she's also trained to be in the dunes and help um, fix up that management. Or actually stuff. feel free to, to talk to her so she knows. Oh, yeah, that's true, too. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, go say hi to her. Just don't yell at her. She's allowed to be there. She's Does awesome. She that identifies that she's we're gonna give her a main Audubon hat this year. Um <laughs> she's usually out there in the evening, but no, she yeah. identified her. I actually started talking and then she's told me who she was. Yeah, so she'll probably be wearing I think yeah, outdoor gear. Yeah. Um, and then I saw her a lot. Of yeah. yeah, but she she looks like she knows what she's doing and she's supposed to be there. So if you see someone who looks <laughs> not confused and they're not like, oh, why am I in here? That's probably Jess. Um so yeah, say hi to her. She's awesome. Um, beach management agreements. So um, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has um, specific agreements with each municipality for the beaches. I'm not sure of all of the guidelines and rules specific to Scarborough. Um, a lot of that is stuff for public <laughs> works, where they can drive, where they can clear rack off. Um, there are also, I think the dog guidelines are fall underneath the beach agreements. Um, and then how we would handle if there is a take um, in a particular municipality. Um, all of that is covered under agreements that Fish and Wildlife makes with the town. Um, so those are in place already to protect rovers. And if you're interested, the town's beach management agreement is on our piping plugger page on the website, which can be difficult to, to find, um, but I will send it in an email to, um, to you all. Mm -hmm. um, and the town's um, animal control ordinance and piping plugger protection ordinance are appendices to that agreement. So um, they basically, the agreement kind of lays out um, what the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife wants the town to do, and our ordinance gives us the ability to enforce certain things and basically comply with the management agreement. <laughs> 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 
Um, okay, so you guys are on the beach. Um, there are a lot more volunteers than there are Audubon staff. So it's very possible that you guys may be the first responder, the first person on the scene if something does happen. Um, in that situation, it's really important to document what's happening. So taking photos, um, if you can safely without disrupting any of the birds, um, writing down details of the interaction, um, perhaps other people involved. And then your next step is to start calling people. So flip that um, name tag that you have over and start calling down the line. Um, leave voicemails. But sometimes, you know, we're we're busy. Sometimes we're up in Fifth Park and we don't have cell phone reception for eight or nine hours. Um, so just keep calling down the line until you actually get somebody on the phone. Um, that's really important. We all try to check our voicemails and, and be attentive to that so nothing falls through the cracks. Just keep calling until you, you get somebody that you talk to. And from there, you can pass the responsibility on to them. Um, but it's really important to just make sure that that somebody knows what's happening. Um, and like I said, document it all. Um, more photos, the better. The more information we have about it, the better. Um, let's see. This is a new slide for me. I haven't done this one yet. Okay, so incident protocol. Um, secure the scene. Try to make sure nobody's in danger. You're not in danger. Um, try not to disturb anything. So heaven forbid it is a take of an adult bird and the dead bird is laying on the beach. Um, don't move it. It's a lot easier to see what happened if it's, it's where it was um, after the incident took place. Um, make the appropriate calls. Jamie, ourselves at Maine Audubon, the police department, IFNW, um, somebody, somebody will answer their phone. There's a lot of us on the project. At, at some point, you'll get in touch with someone to take the reins. Um, and then be a good observer and just document what you see um, and what you know about the situation. Could we get a copy of that slide? Sure. Um, what not to do, do not put yourself at risk. Um, again, same circling back to the dog rules, all of it. We love these birds, but at no point in time is it worth putting your own safety or the safety of somebody else at risk for these birds. Um, we appreciate everything you're doing, but you are far more important to us um, at the end of the day than the birds. It's tough to say that, but it's true. You guys matter. <laughs> um, don't handle the bird dead or alive. Leave it where it is. Um, if you do think it's injured, if it's been bit by an animal, um, you're only going to stress it out more by trying to handle it. So just just leave it alone, um, and we'll get there and take care of it. Um, and then do not interfere with the scene scene of the crime. Um, I think we put that in parentheses because we do give this this talk to the police force, and we say that, and they're like, okay, the scene of the crime. <laughs> um, but yeah, don't interfere, leave it how it is, take photos, take good information, um, and then get us on the line. So we appreciate your collaboration. Obviously, um, it's great to have people returning. It's great to have new faces. Like I mentioned before, this program would be absolutely impossible without our volunteer force. So you guys are making a huge difference. You guys are the reason that we have had the most successful years back to back to back. Um, we couldn't do that. There's what, five, seven, seven of us on a good day on the main Audubon team. Um, and we're doing beaches from Nagunquit all the way up to Reed State Park. So it's quite a bit of work, um, quite a few birds for us to keep track of. So we would, it, it would be impossible without you guys. So we really truly appreciate that you guys are doing this, this work for us and for the birds. Um, and remember to clock your hours because your funding um, goes to pay for for the program. So um, the more volunteer hours, the more predator exposures we can have, and the more stake and twine we can have, and the more signs, um, and the more education and outreach we can do with those funds. So it's really important um, that you guys are part of this. So thank you. And thank you, like I just said. <laughs> um, these are our partners here. So um, some of the, the organizations and municipalities that we work with. Um, and again, without without this group of people, this would be would be very difficult, if not impossible, for us to do. 
Um, and then the fun stuff. So the Plover hotline, if you call it right now, Silas will answer it. Yeah. No, yeah, it's in the truck. That was like <laughs> <laughs> um, Plover hotline. So one of us has that phone all the time. Um, we'd like to say that we will answer it right away every single time. Um, but leave us a voicemail and we'll call you back. <laughs> Um, and then our email, so pluvreturn at mainaudubon.org. That goes out to everybody in our program from um, the program director, Laura Zitsky, um, all the way down. Well, I guess our interns won't get that, but all of the biologists on the crew, um, it goes to all of us. So everybody gets the email, somebody will see it. And then our Instagram page is fun, um, at Maine Coastal Birds Crew. Um, we have a new education and outreach person this year, Mackenzie. Um, she's working really hard on implementing our Pets for Plovers program um, and revamping our Instagram. So lots of good footage there to see the birds and see what they're doing. Um, so give that a follow. You can also, if you guys are feeling super tech savvy and you take a picture, you can hashtag share the shore. Um, so it's a fun little thing and then it, it may get picked up and shared elsewhere. Um, and then our new website, petsforplovers.org. Um, so we are trying really hard to bolster relationships with pet owners instead of having constant conflict. Um, one of the ways we're doing this is the new program where pet owners can sign their pets up um, for our pledge. The pledge is on the website. Essentially, you're saying, I will follow the dog rules, the leash rules, keep my cat inside. Um, I will do everything I can with my pet to be a responsible pet owner and make sure that the plovers are safe. Um, when they sign up for that pledge, Jamie has all this good stuff. So their dog will get a Pets for Plovers bandana. <laughs> and you can them if you'd like to sign your pets up. Um, we have these nice new leashes this year. And then somewhere in here, we have stickers and wind decals, but I don't. They're buried, so you can use your imagination to let those look right. Um, but people who have good pets, good dogs, and good indoor kitties are welcome to sign up for this. Um, and we're hoping that that will help build relationships with pet owners instead of um, continuing some of the the headbutting that we have had so far. Um, so that is everything from me. Questions from you guys? Yep, yeah, couple. Cool. Um, one leg. One leg. Yeah. <laughs> so one leg. Um, last year on Western, we did have, I fondly named him Captain Jack Sparrow. He truly had one leg. He was hopping around on one leg. <laughs> Plovers can lose a leg and they can live a normal life um, and continue to do what they do and they will hop around. 99% of the time when you see a one-legged plover, he's flamingoing. He's got cold feet, cold legs, and they will pull one leg up and they'll even hop. For a distance and you're like oh do you have two legs um if you wait a couple minutes you may see them switch legs or put the other leg down um i do it too all the time i'm like do you have two legs do you have one leg and then they'll kind of drop the other leg and you're like, all right you're good to go um often it's just because they're cold okay um this nest that we saw in uh, those two eggs that are out on western mm -hmm. hatching in may when what does that hatch um we won't 28 days from the fourth egg in the clutch but so, two, so two more. Two more. It usually takes this weather. They're they're a little slow to the draw, um, but it usually takes about five ish, five to seven days, I would say, to lay a full clutch. So, when are we looking um, at for what's your anticipated time frame for? I guess the start, the start of the general hatching. So, a gunquit. We're already four or five days in to that twenty-eight days. Um, so, hatching will start down there within within a month. Yeah. Western today, three eggs, I believe, was the biggest clutch that we have out there right now. Um, I would expect those birds to lay the fourth egg in two days or so. Um, Jess will probably be the one to catch that. She'll be out there next. She'll let me know. I'll let Jamie know. And then we can start the 28 day clock. Okay. Um, so likely early June. Yes. And the mm -hmm. nests that we do have out on Western right now do have predator exposures around them. Um, we've had some significant fox tracks and we've also had a lot of people 
with dogs walking through the dunes. So I think to, as of today, we have five pairs. Um, two of those are nesting. Oh, oh, so it's two exposures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two exposures, two pairs that are officially paired with nests, um, and then three other pairs that are kind of figuring out what they want to do. But I'm expecting to see five pairs total on, on Western. Pine Point right now, we have one pair, but we have six or seven pairs out on Higgins with yeah. four nests already. Um, and yeah, last week, it was looking looking like we might have seven pairs on, on Western, but yeah, it was, but I think what was happening, there was some movement around, um, there was a lot of dog disruption. I think, so they jumped back and forth from Pine Point to eat. Um, they also jumped from Scarborough Beach State Park over to Western in the beginning of the year. So I think what was happening is there were seven pairs staking out mm -hmm. and a couple of them realized that the, there wasn't great room or they didn't like the habitat or whatever it was and or a dog they, ran through their nest yeah. yeah that also was probably the more likely reason um so they'll they'll just go somewhere else in yeah. so earlier when i was there um there were seven distinctive scraping territories um but since then a few of the pairs have kind of gone elsewhere Okay, and then next one, how do you tell the male from the female? Pretty difficult, um, <laughs> even for me. I was trying to figure out today if L80 was the male or the female. It is the male. Um, so there is a ornithological word for this. I call it a unibrow. Uh, that's what it says. Uh, it it may be called a crown. I To me, it looks like he has a big old unibrow. So the male will have a thicker, more prominent marking there. Um, and this isn't always the case. Sometimes the males aren't, and they're very, very similar. <laughs> and then his neck band generally goes all the way around thick. Um, so the way this one, if you guys can see that, the way it doesn't connect in the front leads me to believe, I don't know if you guys can see that there, um, leads me to believe that this is probably a female. Um, if you guys go look at L80 when you're on, on Western Beach, you will see he has beautiful, beautiful markings, um, really thick around. He's got a really prominent unibrow, really striking. And when his female stands next to him, her band doesn't quite attach in the front um, and her markings aren't as striking. So when you see the two of them together, you can really see that difference. That's not always the case. If I see a clover and I just see one, sometimes I'm like, oh. Could be a male, could be a female. I don't know. So difficult. Yes. Um, do they nest on Scarborough Beach? They do. I found the first they nest today. Okay. Yes, they do. Okay. Um, so Scarborough Beach technically is a state park, so the um the state is involved in that, but it's privately owned by the Sprague family. Um, so they have Black Point Corporation monitors the beaches. So they do no dogs allowed except for their lifeguard trained dogs on that beach. Um, and then Greg Wolfert is in charge, he's the beach manager, um, and he's really receptive of all of that. So we have a program over there. Um, I don't think you guys can't get in with your passes nope. over there. I was gonna say, you're welcome to walk around there. Scarborough Beach is tough. Um, it's right on the dunes there, and there's a lot of wild habitat. So predation there is really heavy. Um, coyotes and foxes, especially, really terrorize the beach over there. The birds have a tough time. The nesting habitat is low. So last year we lost a ton of nests over there to tidal events. Um, I found the first egg today. So good luck to the little birds over there. I think there are three pairs there. Um, we'll see, hopefully they have a, a better time of it this year than last year. But to the left or to, I guess um, the left. they were all to the left. Right? Yeah, yeah, you come out on the beach from that main entrance. Yep, they're all kind of down. Down they don't do a good job of monitoring for dogs after hours. I don't think so, no. Yeah, and I think there are other entrances yeah. from private yeah, they, houses they, they, down. So that's a struggle. It's, it's, yeah, the dog thing is a struggle everywhere this year, more so than it, than it has been. But And just in terms of Scarborough Beach, when you receive um, the weekly updates that I send out, I do include the numbers for Scarborough Beach, um, just so you can kind of see how things are are going there. I include all four Scarborough Beaches. Um, there's a little ask you into the end sure. of the day, Scarborough yeah. emails. Okay. Sure. All right. I will. 
um, but there's a little asterisk in there that says monitored by state park staff um, because none of our volunteers are assigned to Scarborough Beach. Yeah, and we get out there, but like I said, it's we don't have a lot of plovers out there, and it's a really tough habitat for them. So we give them the best chance that that they can have, but really they should just pick a different area. We'd have a better chance. Is there somebody monitoring to, to beaches? Yeah, Silas. Oh, um, well, everyone. But so Silas is in charge. Um, well, Crescent doesn't. Crescent has two really great volunteers, and we're starting. We're like putting together a volunteer program, like you guys have here. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of in its infancy. Um, the other Cape Beach. Well, that's the, the main Cape. Yeah, Grand Island is private. That's the Sprague's private estate in a gated mm -hmm. community. Um, we're only allowed in there. I thought it's very particular about going in there, but they're also very protective over the birds. Mm -hmm. um, so they allow friends and family to have dogs, always leash, never any issues out there. They're just, they're really, really protective over the birds on the island. So that's nice. Um, makes our job easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what other Cape Beaches? That's it, right? Kettle Cove. Kettle Cove. Kettle Cove oh, doesn't get. Yeah. 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 Okay. Crescent? Yeah, but Crescent, Crescent's the one where they're trying to get we're trying to get volunteers together. There's there's one pair at Crescent right now. Oh, um, yeah. And they're I trying to they really successful last year. Yeah. Um, they, they were hundred percent success rate, right? Yeah. For I what? think so. Yeah. So one one was a brood of two. They only hatched two of their four eggs. Mm -hmm. Um both their chicks made it, and then the other brood F. Yeah. The other brood, I think, yeah, started like, this four and maybe lost a chick, but but it, they um, do well there. They do, yeah. It's for it's a busy no beach. Yeah, they do really well there. And yeah, yeah, no dogs are allowed there, right? Yeah, there's yeah. no dogs because it's except for today when park. there was a dog walking around off the beach when we showed up. But trucks that go down there sometimes. Yeah, um, but we're always in contact. The the manager manager, I don't know. What yeah, park manager. Yeah, the park yeah. manager uh, for uh, forgetting mm -hmm. his last name is great. He's very receptive and. Happy to you know um, do and you know, all the other stuff. So if there's, if there's vehicles, usually someone is spotted. Yeah, yeah, hopefully the yeah. must take care of the dog, the dog friendly people, and not let yeah. their dogs. The inn is also really receptive. The yeah, they have a ton of yeah. this information. They yeah. tell their guests, especially if they have birds right outside. Right. Um, right. So it's so nice to have have a lot of people on on yeah. our team in our on our side of the field. Um, it obviously makes it a lot easier when the people that are by the beaches all the time um, are going to bat for the clovers. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's difficult, you know, if I'm walking around in Scarborough, people, who are you? Where do you live? And I'm like, self prison. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you pay taxes here. You can't tell me what to do. Um, so, you know, sometimes you guys have a little more pull because you can go, well, I do pay taxes here. So, um, <laughs> Just pretend that you do if you're if you're yeah. not from Scarborough. Right. Nobody's I checking. Yeah, yeah, wait. I <laughs> Any other questions this evening? Yeah. How do the birds respond to you arriving to uh, oh, they don't build like an, ex an exposure oh. or the way that yeah. sensory may work? They don't love it. I like to feel in my heart that they all love me on a personal level. <laughs> um, they do not. They don't. So part of our. Um, protocol and data collection when we're doing predator management um, is amount of time that goes is off the nets. Um, so we, while we're doing it, we don't want the bird in there. Um, we're taking things around, we're disrupting, and then when we put the netting over the top, if it's not tight enough and a bird flies up into that, that can be a really dangerous situation. So we kind of do a little movement around the outside like this and kind of deter them from coming in while we're building that. Um, and then once we have the, the net on top, we um, track how many minutes it takes for the bird to come back in. And we always wanna make sure that we see the bird come back in because sometimes that, that management is enough to scare them. And if it seems that they're not going to be protective of it, we'll immediately remove it and, and let them let nature take its course and let them protect on their own. Um, not all nests are explosable. We kind of use discretion on that. So if you guys do see a nest and you're like, why isn't this exposed? There's likely a good reason behind it. And usually they won't expose until there's at least three eggs in the nest mm -hmm. because the birds are then committed to that nest. Mm -hmm. And so they're more likely to come back to it 
um, when they've put that much effort to lay three eggs. Yeah. All right, very good. Any other last questions? Anything on Zoom? Thank you guys for lending your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything okay. that's due on. We do team. have, there is one more question. Oh, one more question. If, if I wasn't able to make um, this meeting, how do I get in contact with you to pick up the badge and the um, parking? Yeah, so I'll send out an email about that. They'll be um, available in the town in the town office in the planning department, which is in the basement. But I'll send out a follow up email um, tomorrow about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.